In this video, we will look at the errors you can make in hypothesis testing and how we deal with these errors. So this is based on chapter 9 again, still section 9.1, specifically pages 428 to 434 of your textbook. Now in your study guide, you will see that we've already dealt with the first two topics and we will now move on to type 1 and type 2 errors and understanding the relationship between those two types of errors and the risks associated with them. So please make sure as always that you understand all these concepts that we list here um, and that you are comfortable with them. Now in hypothesis testing, it is of course possible to make errors and we'll start by looking at the court of law example that we used before. So let's say that we are considering the truth and the judgment that we make. So the truth might be that a person is not guilty or that they are guilty and a judgment could be then that they are found guilty or not guilty. So if they are not guilty and we find them not guilty, then we've made the correct decision. If they are guilty and we found them guilty, then we have again made the right decision. But if a person is guilty and we find them not guilty, then we've made an error. And if we find a person not guilty, but they are actually guilty, then of course we've made an error as well. And this is similar in a hypothesis test. So in a hypothesis test, we could have that the null is true, or we could have that the null is not true. And our decision will be to not reject the null or to reject the null. Remember that we will never ever say um, that we accept the null, and we'll get into that in the next lecture a bit more. Now, if the null is true and we don't reject it, then we've made the right decision. And if the null is not true and we have rejected it, then we've made the right decision again. Whereas if we um, know that the null is not true and we didn't reject it, then we've made a wrong decision. Um, and if it's true, but we did reject it, then we've made an error as well. And these errors have special names. So the first one we'll look at is a type 1 error, and that is when the null is true, but we've rejected it. And the second type of error is a type 2 error, which is um, when the null is not true. In other words, an alternative, a value under the alternative is correct, but we have um, not rejected the null, that is a type 2 error. And obviously we would want to minimize the risk of making these errors as much as possible. Now, if we take a step back, step one in our hypothesis testing was formulating our null and alternative. And just a reminder, this always has to be in terms of, our no uh, of a population parameter. So um, mu, p, sigma squared, difference of mean, so mu1 minus mu2, that would work as well. Um, and we generally denote this generically by just using a theta. So theta can be replaced by any population parameter. Then we also have a value under the null, which we call the null value or the hypothesized value. And we just add a little subscript zero. So that is going to be an actual value that our whole theory and our whole test is based around. Then again, we can just denote that by a generic theta zero as well. Now, step two is finding a test statistic. So deciding what is an appropriate test statistic to use, thinking about the distribution of that test statistic and deciding on a decision rule, taking into account the risks involved in hypothesis testing. So this is now where the new work comes in. So here we will consider a type 1 error and a type 2 error, which we've already defined. So type 1 is rejecting the null when it is true, and type 2 is if we don't reject the null when the null is actually false. So we need to keep these in mind when we actually define our hypotheses. And we also want to think about the distribution of the test statistic because that will tell us how big these um, the risks associated with these errors are. Now let's look at an example first. So let's say X is the nicotine content of cigarettes. We've already looked at this example before, and we've said that we want to test whether the mean is greater than 1.5 milligrams. And again, notice no um, units are shown in the null and alternative, 
we know it's in milligrams, but we're not going to put that in our null an alternative. So in truth, it could be that the nicotine content is at most 1.5 milligrams. And here it's important to remember that when we do our test, we are always just going to use an equal sign for our null. So we're not going to put uh, less or equal, even though that's what we mean. Um, we're not going to use that. We are always going to stick with just um, that the null is an equal sign. Then we could also have that the nicotine content is more than 1.5, so that could be the truth. Um, and remember, we are testing this. So here the sign is quite important because what we're testing is our alternative. Now, our decision could be that we reject um, or don't reject the null. Um, so we're basically concluding that the nicotine content is at most 1.5 milligrams. Or we reject the null, which means that we're saying that um, we have enough evidence to support the alternative, which means that the content appears to be more than 1.5 milligrams. So if we say here that nicotine content is at most 1.5 milligrams, and we, um, so that's the truth, and we say that it appears to be at most 1.5 milligrams, we've made a correct decision. If we say that the nicotine, or if we know that the nicotine content is 1.5 or more than 1.5 milligrams, and our test led us to reject the null, then again, we are in the right situation. So we've made the right decision. But we could also make errors. So if we are in this block here, we've made an error. If we're in that block there, we've made an error as well. Now, Type 1 error, just a reminder, is that we reject the null given that the null is true. So we're conditioning on the fact that the null is true. And that would happen over here. So we reject the null in this line over here. And given that the null is true in this column, this is when the null is true. So this is our type 1 error. So if we want to interpret that, it means that we're saying that there is more than 1.5 milligrams in um, the uh, cigarettes of nicotine, but actually that is not the case. So we've made an error. Now in the same way, type 2 error, do not reject the null, which happens over here. And given the alternative is true, that happens over there. So this is a type 2 error. And if we interpret that, then all we need to say is we are concluding that the nicotine content is more or at most um, 1.5 milligrams when actually it is more than 1.5 milligrams. So it's important that you can understand realistically what that conclusion is that we come to, where the mistake comes in, what that means in practice. And you can see we're not exaggerating here. We're not carrying on about what the consequences will be of making this. We're not speculating about that. We're just saying we conclude the nicotine content is not more than 1.5 milligrams when it actually is. It's a very straightforward statement that we've made here. And you should be able to do this as well. So now our question is, what is the biggest error? So we know there's two errors and there will always be the possibility of these two errors, but we want to minimize it as much as possible. Now, court of law example again, we can think, what is the worst error to make? Is it worse to send a guilty person to um, jail um, or not send... A at least it's not send the guilty person to jail. So that's our type two error over there. Or is it worse to send someone who is not guilty to jail? So which one is the worst one? And I think if you are the defendant, if you're guilty and you're found not guilty, that's not uh, the worst thing in the world for you necessarily. For the court, it might not be the best thing either. But if we want to send a person to jail, or if we send a person to jail and they're not guilty, that is maybe the worst of the two. We can debate this for, for a while, but let's move on. Now, if we think of our cigarette example, um, then 
we again have these two types of errors and we can debate whether which one is the, the worst one. And it again, depends on which perspective we're looking for. So if we make a type one error here, let's say we have um, decided that uh, we reject the null when the null is actually true. So that is again, our type one error. So that would mean that we think there's more um, nicotine in here than there actually is. The nicotine content is at most um, 1.5. So that's the truth. Then what that basically means is that we're concluding that there's less, or, or we, we're concluding that there's more nicotine in the cigarettes than there actually is. So if you are a client, then you might think you're getting more um, nicotine in than you actually are. Um, for the manufacturer, this um, could also be problematic. Then if we think nicotine content more than 1.5, that's the truth, but the content appears to be at most 1.5. So here we have our type two error. So if you're a consumer and the manufacturer tells you, well, there seems to be only um, at most 1.5 um, milligrams of nicotine and we reject the null or we don't reject the null when actually there is more than 1.5 milligrams of nicotine then you're getting a lot more in than you expect and that could maybe lead to some legal problems for the manufacturer so each case depending on which side you can look from could be um worse for for the the one um, in the one scenario and worse for the other person in the other scenario. So we need to decide which one is the biggest risk. And that is important for setting up our hypotheses. Now, calculation of error probabilities, um, that would be the risks that we have in hypothesis testing. So the first one that we're going to look at is the um, probability of making a type one error which is the probability of rejecting the null when it's actually true, we're going to denote that by alpha. So that is very general. You'll see that in every single textbook. Alpha is always the risk of committing a type 1 error. And then for a type 2 error, we're going to call that beta. And you'll see here that I've said here, the prob it's the probability of the null not being rejected given that some value under the alternative is true. So you'll see that well, depending on what value we choose, beta is going to differ, but we're always going to work with just a single value for alpha. Now, let's say that we have a example here. Two companies are installing fiber and we want to find out which is the preferred company. So we could um, test the, the, the hypothesis, the null hypothesis, the proportion is 0 0.5. So half of the people prefer A. Um, against the alternative that more than half of the people prefer uh, company A. And let's say we're using a sample of size 25. Now, you can go and check those assumptions that you need to, to use the central limit theorem, and you will see that we can um, work with a normal distribution, but let's look at it a little bit differently here. So let's say we're looking at X, the number who prefer uh, um, company A then we are not going to have to worry about the normal distribution. We'll do a different example for the normal distribution just now. But if we translate this back to X, we know X actually just has a binomial distribution. And if half the people uh, prefer company A, so that is the null is true, then on average, we should have between 12 and 13 people um, who prefer A, which means that there's really no preference because half prefer the one, half prefer the other one. So there's no real winner in terms of preference. Now let's look at some different rejection regions and how this impacts our, um, our risks of making errors in these um, scenarios. So let's say we're going back to that example again and where we just pick a number. So we are going to say if half the people um, or the, the alternative is true, that the proportion of people who prefer A is more than 0 0.5, we obviously need to um, look for a value 
which is larger than 12 to 13 for our rejection region. And let's say we're taking 17. So if we observe 17 or more people who prefer A in our sample of size 25, then we are going to reject the null. Now, alpha is, again, the probability of a type 1 error. So it's really important that you are able to calculate these probabilities or these risks. And we always start by writing down our definition. So if you're unsure where to start, just start with the definition and then expand from that point. So we know alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. Now, if we expand that a little bit, we write what a type 1 error is. A type 1 error is just rejecting the null when the null is true. Then we can start thinking about the problem. So if we reject the null, in this case, this will happen if our value of x, the number of people who prefer a in our sample, is at least 17. And the null true, we just look back at how we've defined it. So the proportion is 0.5. Now, we know that we're dealing with a binomial distribution here. x has a binomial distribution. So under the null hypothesis, so let's actually write that distribution down. So under the null hypothesis, x has a binomial distribution. There's n is 25 and p is 0 0.5. So that is under the null, and you'll hear those words a lot still. Now, we know with the binomial probability that x is greater or equal to 17 is the same as saying the 1 minus the probability that x is less or equal to 16. And that is just, under the null hypothesis, the binomial probability, um, 1 minus the binomial probability, of x being less or equal to 16. This is the notation you've used before. And we're using these parameters that we have under the null. So under the null just means we assume the null hypothesis is true. And if you go do that calculation, you end up with an answer of 0.054. So the probability of us making a type 1 error in this case is 0.054. Um, so we can now look at a different scenario and say, but let's say we change our rejection region. So let's take a value which gets us closer to the 12 or 13 um, that we expect to be true, uh, uh, expect to prefer A under the null hypothesis, and we repeat this process. So we again start with our definition. What is the probability of take, uh, making a type 1 error? which is just the probability of rejecting the null, given the null is true. So we write down what that means. Here, we will reject the null if we get a value of x greater or equal to 14. Again, under the null, the proportion of people who prefer a is 0 0.5. And again, we follow that same logic and we get to an answer of 0 0.345. So you can see here, if we chose that cutoff point here as 17, the chances of making a type 1 error was significantly less than if we use the cutoff point of zero, uh, 14. So you can see by moving this um, cutoff point closer to what we expect to see if the null is true, we're actually risking um, rejecting the null incorrectly a lot more. And that's important to understand that. Now, let's say we want to calculate beta. And we look again at the same cutoff points and see what the risks associated with a type 2 error will be. So let's say here that, again, we're using the 17. And we now want to calculate beta. So the scenario is exactly the same. So beta is the probability of making a type 2 error. Now, Again, if we write that down uh, or expand on what we've written down, this means the probability of not rejecting the null given that the null is not true. And like we mentioned earlier, the null not being true is quite a wide range of values. So it's pretty much any value greater than 0 0.5 for the proportion. So let's go just look at a specific value. So we're just going to look at 0 0.6. And I can write that then as 
the probability of not rejecting the null. So remember, we'll reject the null if x is greater or equal to 17. So not rejecting that happens when x is less or equal to 16. And we have assumed some value under the alternative for that proportion. Now, that means that we are going to calculate the binomial probability that x is less or equal to 16, given this distribution under the alternative, or a distribution under the alternative. Because remember, we could have used 0 0.7 here, we could have used 0 0.8, and we'll do that just now as well, to see how that changes our risk of a type 2 error. But we're just assuming for now that the... Um, the actual proportion in the population is 0 0.6 and that's what we're basing this calculation on and you can see in this scenario there's quite a high risk of making a type 2 error so we saw that there was a low risk of the type 1 error um, but a much higher risk now for the type 2 error now if we look at what happens if we change that cutoff point again. So we're changing it to the 14 that we saw before as well. And remember with that one, we had a higher risk of making a type one error. So let's see what happens with the type two error. So again, start with our definition and see where we go from there. So again, we will use that specific 0 0.6 value and we could have used a different value as well. And you'll see in your textbook, there is an example where it shows you the curve that's created by considering different values under the alternative. And that's something you can play around with in R as well. We'll get to that in your practical. Now, beta is, in this case, the probability of not rejecting the null. And again, look at this, not rejecting the null. We go back to what that cutoff point is. And we don't reject the null if it is outside that x value is outside this range smallest x value we can observe outside this range is 13 so we won't reject the null if x is 13 or less and again we are making assumption on, uh, about this proportion under the alternative a specific value under the alternative so if we do that calculation we end up with this probability so here we can now see that in the first case our alpha was small but our beta was large. Here, we had a larger alpha, but a smaller beta. So you can kind of already start seeing that there's a bit of a trade-off between these two errors, and we'll look at how we can address that later on. Now, let's look at the effect of the cutoff point again with a different scenario. And I want you guys to do this first. So let's look at the scenario first. X is the diastolic blood pressure of a healthy person. And let's say we assume that x is normally distributed, 70.5, 3.2 squared is our variance. And we want to know, does a supplement decrease diastolic blood pressure? So our first question is, what are the hypotheses that we are testing? So I want to give you a moment to just think about that first. So pause the video and then write down your null and alternative and look at um, what your risks for alpha would be if you pick some random cutoff point. So let's say that you've written this down. So let's just continue here. So we say let mu be the mean diastolic blood pressure for people using the supplement. And that would mean that H naught, the null hypothesis, is that the mean is 70.5. The alternative is that the mean is less than 70.5. And that we get by say, uh, looking at this question. So our research question was, does the supplement decrease your diastolic blood pressure? And that's why we have a less than here. Now, let's say we're using a N is 40, and we're saying X bar is the sample mean for people using the supplement um, for the diastolic blood pressure, and we'll consider different rejection regions. So the first one we will consider is less than um, 69, uh, uh, the, the diastolic blood pressure. So if we get a sample mean, sorry, this should say X bar less than 69. So if we have this scenario, I want you to think quickly, how would you calculate your probability of a type one error? So please pause the video 
and first try this calculation on your own. All right. So again, we start by writing down our definition. So alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. Now, that just means the probability of rejecting the null given the null is true. Now, we will reject the null in this case if x bar is less or equal to 69. So, that is what we will write there. The probability that x bar is less or equal to 69 given that the mean is actually 70.5. So, given the alternative, uh, or sorry, the null is true. So, that is what's happening here. Now, next step is to do this calculation to think. Now, x bar, what distribution does x bar have? So we know we need that distribution in order to do our calculations. Now, if we look at this, we know x is a normal distribution. So regardless of sample size, x bar will also have a normal distribution. So we know we're going to work with the normal distribution here. So let's say we didn't know that x bar had an or x had a normal distribution. In that case, our sample size is actually sufficiently large to use the central limit theorem and say that x bar would have an approximate normal distribution. So always keep that in mind. Those assumptions that we give you are there for a reason. If we um, don't, if they're not met, it means we can't apply the different techniques. Now. Because we know x bar has a normal distribution, under the null hypothesis, this distribution of x bar will be 70.5 for the mean, and the variance will be 3.2 squared over the sample size. So remember, this is our variance. This is the distribution under the null hypothesis. Now, you can see that that is what we use to standardize here. We subtracted the mean under the null hypothesis and we divided by the standard deviation under the null hypothesis, which means that we need the cumulative probability of z being less than minus 2.96. And you can see here how the previous chapters work is coming into play yet again. So we told you before that all of these chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, and so on, We'll be building on the concepts we used in chapter 6 and even before that. Now, if you go back to your normal tables, you will find the probability of making a type 1 error in this case is very, very small. Now, if we look at the probability that um, or we use a different cutoff point, let's again just fix this, this should be x bar. We will use a cutoff point where if x bar is less or equal to 70, then we will reject the null hypothesis. So again, I want you to pause the video and see if you can do this calculation yourself. So again, we'll start with alpha, definition of alpha. It's just the probability of making a type 1 error. And that is the probability that the null is rejected given the null is true. And if you write this down, you shouldn't make any mistakes. So it's always a good idea to write your definitions down, write your formulas down, and think about what you're substituting and where you're substituting and why, um, so that you don't make silly mistakes. Now again, we will reject the null in this case if x bar is less or equal to 70. And we know under the null, the mean is 70.5. So again, we can use the distribution of x bar under the null hypothesis to go do this calculation. And you can see if we chose a cutoff point closer to the null value, then we would have had a larger probability of a type 1 error. Now, similarly, we can look at beta. So again, we'll use the same rejection regions. Let's fix it again. So this has to be x bar. And we can do that calculation. And I want you guys to do that calculation under the assumption that the population mean is actually now 68.6. So notice that this 68.6 is a value under the alternative, a specific value. And we could have done this calculation for any value under the alternative. I just chose 68.6. Now. Have a look and see if you can do this calculation and then we'll look at the solution.
All right, so beta in this case, the probability of not rejecting the null, not rejecting the null happens when x bar is greater than 69. Given the alternative, the value under the alternative, that specific one we're just going to look at is the 68.6. .6. And if we do that calculation, now we are using a distribution under the alternative. So we are saying here, x bar has a normal distribution and the mean here is going to be 68.6 and our variance doesn't change. So this is still 3.2 squared over 40. And so it's just the alternative that has now affected our mean. Now, if we do this calculation using the methods we used before, we'll see there's quite a large risk of making a type 2 error. So we said there was a very small risk of the type 1 error, but we can see a larger one for the type 2 error. And again, I want you to use the same cutoff point as before, x bar less or equal to 70, to calculate the type 2 error in this scenario. So again, the probability that the null is not rejected, not rejecting the null happens when x bar is larger than 70. So we substitute that in and we substitute in our value under the alternative for the mean. And we go back to the calculations you've done before and that gives us this probability in the end. So you can see now it's changed. So we saw that there was a high risk of making a type 1 error when we use 70 as our cutoff point, but you can see there's a very small probability of making a type 2 error. So again, those two, if you increase the one probability, the other one's going to decrease. So how can we deal with this? Now, before we get to that, we'll first look at the effect of the alternative that we consider. So let's say, for instance, we are um, back in the scenario with the fiber. If we calculated the probability of a type 2 error using 0 0.6 as our um, value under the alternative, what happens if we change it to 0 0.8? So again, you can see 0 0.8 is a value that's true under the alternative. So if we change that to 0 0.8, we can just change this calculation slightly. You can see only thing that's changed here is the 0 0.8 that we've added in, in the place of the 0 0.6. And you can see that that probability is now smaller. So it seems like the more further away this value is from the hypothesized value, the smaller the type 2 risk becomes. And the same thing happens if we look at the other cutoff point. If we had a more, or let's say we had our um, true value of the parameter, the population parameters, deeper into this alternative region, then the risk of making a type 2 error becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So we can look at that with graphs as well. And like I mentioned before, we'll do that in your practical in R. So it it's very easy to do that kind of calculation and to actually visualize it with a graph when you're using software like R. Now, summary of these two types of risks that are very important to understand. And this is probably one of the hardest things in hypothesis testing to understand. So if you're getting it, then that's fantastic. Um, so first thing is, further the cutoff point from um, the hypothesized value, the smaller our alpha will become and the larger our beta will become. The further away the true value of the parameter from the hypothesized parameter, the smaller beta becomes. We've seen that in our last example. Now, if we want both of them to be small, both of those risks to be small, then our sample size has to be increased. And you can go and try that yourself. So if you go and repeat these examples, let's say you keep everything we had the same, 
but you change the sample size. Let's look at this example for example. Um, maybe go change this value to 100 and see what effect that will have on your um, values of alpha and beta. Now, and then you can see that this is actually true. So usually we said we need to decide on what's the biggest risk and in hypothesis testing we choose our null and alternative so that alpha is the bigger risk, the one that we care about the most and we control for that. So we formulate null, uh, the null and alternative so that alpha is minimized and we will look at examples of that as well. So for our court of law example, alpha is the probability that a person is found guilty when they're not guilty. We don't want to send innocent people to jail. So we would want to minimize that. So we, we would rather accept not sending a guilty person to jail than um, sending an innocent person. Um, well, sorry, we would rather not say, we would rather keep a guilty person out of jail than sending an innocent person into jail. So that is the, the moral of the story. Now, just the last example for this video. For any test procedure, we want to minimize alpha um, and we choose uh, the null and alternative in such a way that we minimize alpha and that beta is not, uh, we think of beta as not a very important risk, even though it could be important. Now, this for example, I want you to try this yourself um, before you watch the rest of this video and see whether you understand what is meant by that. So I want you to set up the null and alternative and I'm going to show you two ways of doing that and we'll talk about which one is preferred. Now, let's say we have a company that has a fleet of vehicles, all the same make, model, all of that, and they're using grip tight tires. Um, they're happy with it. And they've seen that these tires on average achieve a distance of 40,000 kilometers. Now, if you've ever had to buy tires, you will know that you don't want to replace them too often. They're quite expensive. The firm is very satisfied with this tire, but they get an offer from the manufacturers of the light tread tires, which basically cost the same as grip tight. And these people say that their project, uh, their tires will get more than 40,000 kilometers. And so if we find that this is true, we will make a switch to light trade tires. So if they cost the same, but we can get more for our money, then why wouldn't we do that? But if we're happy with where we are, we don't want to make a change if it's not going to benefit us. So first thing we do is we formulate our null and alternative. And I think the most natural way of doing this is to say that the mean tire um, under the null, the average um, distance we get from these tires is tires of 40,000 kilometers. And under the alternative, we are interested in seeing whether this new type of tire will give us more than 40,000 kilometers. So in this case, we will only make a switch if we can prove that the alternative is true. So this is where we will make a switch. If this new type of tire gives us more than 40,000 kilometers. Now, if we make a type one error, type one error is that we reject the null given that it's true. So we're making the switch when actually the new tires don't give us more mileage. So that would mean that we conclude that light tread is better when grip tight is actually the better tire. And then we, we make a switch when it's not necessarily beneficial. And remember, this alternate or the null actually implies that it's 40, the average is 40,000 or less. It's an implicit um, thing that we have here. So it might actually be that we're making the switch and this new tire gives us less mileage than the other ones. So Type 2 error is not rejecting the null when the null is false. So we're saying that the null is false. It is less or equal to 40,000 when, um, uh, well, the null is false means that it's more than 40,000. Sorry about that. Um, when actually, um, yeah, we, we say that it's less or equal to 40,000 when actually it's more than that. So we conclude that grip tight is better when light tread is actually the better one and therefore we don't switch the tires when it would be beneficial. So we don't reject the null, we don't switch, 
so we we've made the wrong decision there now if you had defined this differently uh, let's actually look at, at the biggest risk here so for us the biggest risk in this case would be making a switch when it's not beneficial so you can see here that this is the, the type one error is the one that we are the most concerned with here so that is why we've defined our null and alternative in this way now if you had gone and said well we're going to test if the new ties are worse so if they're worse we won't make a switch so we'll actually make the switch if we don't reject the null hypothesis because if we can see that the new tires have less mileage than the old ones then we won't make the switch so we're switching unless we can prove that they're worse that's what happens with this um uh, in this case so you can see here type one error would mean that we um reject the null given it's true so we're going to say that this is worse we don't make the switch so we conclude that light trade is worse when actually it's the same or possibly better. We don't really know that um, because now our alternative or our null here implies greater or equal actually. But remember, we're testing the alternative. We're not testing the null. So it could be that light trade is better. We're not going to make a switch in this case. We've rejected the null. We, we're going to stick with the other ones, but maybe the other the, the switch would have been beneficial. And in this case, do not reject the null given the null is false would mean that we're uh, uh, going to make the switch um, when actually the null was incorrect. So that light trade is, which we're saying that light trade is better when grip tight is actually the better attire and we're making a switch when it's not beneficial to us. So in this case, we said that here, yeah, the type two error is the, the worst one, um, the worst scenario for us. So we don't want the type two error to be the one that um, that is minimized. We want to minimize the type one error. So this is the better way of defining that. And again, it was, what are we interested in? We're interested in seeing whether we get more mileage from this tire. So that's why we define it in this way. And you can see that we end up with different decisions in the end if we um, define it differently. So this second method is not the way that we would want to go about it. We would want to go about this test in the first manner. So whatever we're interested in, that goes in the alternative because that's usually where the biggest risk is associated with the type one error. So for homework, I want you guys to go work through examples 9.1 to 9.5 of your textbook and then also work through exercises 4, 5, 6, 8, 9 and 10 in your um, textbook.